Tonight on NJTV News, what do you call a tax hike that's a tax cut? Trenton horse trading. Would hiking the gas tax while cutting the sales tax generate more money or just move it around? Christie takes his controversial new school funding formula on the road. Would moving extra money from urban schools to the suburbs help all students succeed? Strike preparations in Atlantic City ahead of the holiday weekend. Casino workers say no contract, no work, no kidding. The U.S. Olympic rowing team suits up in Princeton in uniforms designed to hermetically seal them from environmental toxins. And some waterborne sporting events are being postponed because of an infestation of clinging jellyfish. Because even though they're tiny, they've got a savage sting. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health, Wells Fargo, Together We'll Go Far, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. New Jersey could be looking at the first broad-based tax cut in a quarter century. In the dead of night, a deal was cut to refill the flat broke transportation trust fund by raising the gas tax while lowering the sales tax. David Cruz reports on a big plan with a big price tag that came as a big surprise. I went to bed last night and woke up this morning and found out the assembly passed a bill. Senate President Steve Sweeney looked a little like the guy who left the party before all the fun started. After last week's heavy lifting of a Sweeney-backed transportation trust fund plan, it looked like enough lawmakers were going to hold their noses and vote for the thing yesterday. But then Governor Christie joined the talks, and before the night was over, gone were the cuts to the estate tax, charitable giving deductions, and the jet fuel tax all replaced by a 1% cut in the state sales tax and tax deductions on retirement plans. This morning, Sweeney was the one on the outside, and Assembly Speaker Vincent Prieto was the one who got the deal he liked. We were all communicating yesterday, and this was a direction my caucus liked when to go, and I stayed there until the late hours to get, you know, fine-tuning to whatever technical amendments we had to do and get it accomplished. I'm hopeful that, um, you know, when the members of the Senate get the opportunity to consider the fact that we have the first broad-based tax cut for all New Jerseyans in over 20 years, that they'll see the power of that and um, answering the call that people have had for making sure that we have a constitutionally dedicated uh, source of revenue to continue to improve our roads, our bridges, and our mass transit. I, I don't like what I'm hearing, uh, and I am recommending that we run the original bill through that, uh, that I embraced uh, a few weeks ago. When you left last night, you thought there was uh, something different happening in the assembly? We didn't think anything was happening, to be perfectly honest with you. We weren't sure in the Senate about it, you know, when we were discussing. In fact, a lot of the Senate felt it wasn't a good deal, uh, both sides of the aisle. So we just got to figure it out. There are mere days left in the fiscal year, and we appear to be no closer to a TTF deal than we were at this time last year. Or are we? We will talk to the assembly and we'll talk to our caucus and get the temperature of our caucus and we'll have an idea where we're going by Thursday. And is the sales tax something that you can live with in lieu of the other deal? It is. The way we were going, I thought, was the right approach, I'll be honest with you. And the last minute changes are a little difficult. But as I said, within the next day or two, we should have it cleared up. I just don't know how anyone in good conscience could vote to give away $1.6 billion without even having an idea on where that money will come from, how we will replace it, or what programs we will cut in order to meet that funding. On first blush, it may look like there's a billion dollar hole. There's not. Uh, but clearly, th there's no. this is not a final package. It's going over to the Senate, and uh, you can make your argument to the Senate. You're saying that, that the math works? Absolutely. Economists could debate that, but it's the governor who says whether the math works, and it's now up to the Senate president to come to the realization that he agrees. For NJTV News, I'm David Cruz.
This year's budget negotiations don't include next year's school funding formulas, and Governor Christie's campaigning hard for his because his radical plan to give every student equal aid instead of giving kids in struggling districts more would require amending the Constitution. But that wasn't the only thing on his agenda today. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron is at the Governor's Forum in Wall. Michael? Mary Alice, that was the prime thing on his agenda today, but here at an hour and a half town hall on Chris Christie's new school funding formula, uh, someone in the audience asked him about last night's deal on the Transportation Trust Fund. Since he negotiated this surprising new compromise with Vinnie Prieto, it's not surprising that he sounded like he's in favor of it. Here's a little of what he had to say. And for the average person in New Jersey, a 1% cut in the sales tax saves you about $465 a year. An increased gas tax of that amount costs you, for the average driver who drives about between 11 and 12,000 miles a year, which is the average in New Jersey, and the average miles per gallon in New Jersey is about 24 miles per gallon. So it would save the average, it would cost the average driver in New Jersey about $200 a year. So I said, listen, if we're going to raise their taxes, I want to give them a tax cut on the other side. So it's about a $200 tax increase for a $465 tax cut on the other side. You all deserve to have your expenses lowered a little bit. And here's the last piece of the gas tax. It's got to be, it's constitutionally dedicated to only transportation. So we can't spend it on anything else. It's got to be just roads. Now, other than that brief exchange, this forum here was entirely devoted to the fairness formula, as Governor Christie calls it. And as you outlined it, it involves equal state aid of about $6,600 per pupil for every student in the state, breaking with a 30-year tradition of sending more money to the 31 special needs districts. The governor had a big banner behind him today that said, fairness formula, join the movement. Uh, here's a little of his argument for it. We have to think this way, that every child in this state is our child. We're paying enough for them. It's almost like we are. Every child in this state is our child. And for your own child, if they were in a school with a 66% graduation rate and you had any way of getting them out and getting them someplace better, you'd get them out. We have a way to fix this and to lower your taxes at the same time. It's not a bad deal. It's gonna mean breaking some China. It's gonna mean making some people uncomfortable. Well, I'd rather have people uncomfortable than have them failed. Now, Christie wasn't the only one talking school funding today. Senate President Steve Sweeney went to two North Jersey urban municipalities to lobby for his own school funding plan, which involves setting up a Blue Ribbon Commission for a year, promises full funding of the existing formula. Governor Christie's formula is not very popular in the cities. It wasn't very popular with some of the people who participated in a roundtable with Sweeney this morning in Patterson. The current bill as being proposed by the governor, uh, um, it, it, you know, it's really signifies separate but equal. We want, uh, Rosie put it very clearly, uh, uh, equal doesn't mean equitable. And so this is another example of where, 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 where the urban centers, where the concentration of, of black and brown uh, uh, exists, will, will actually suffer un, under this at a time that, that we really can't, we, we can't, uh, uh, we really can't afford it. And I will be the, the person here to say, and I'll be very frank with you, that you know, the governor's uh, proposed policy uh, bill uh, is inherently biased, inherently biased, in, uh, and I'm biased on racial lines. It seeks to pit brown and black people mm -hmm. against those who are not brown and black, and I'm sorry, uh, but that is the true reality of where we are. She just heard it here in Patterson. Patterson got three or 4,000 more students and they don't get any funding for them. How do, you, how do you educate children when you don't get the funding? What's wrong with the governor's formula? We just disagree. You know, my for, what I'm talking about, Michael, isn't urban, suburban. It's all of them. 
there's going to be winners in the suburban areas, there's going to be losers in the suburban areas, there's going to be winners in the urban areas, there's going to be losers in the urban areas. But what's right about my formula is it gets everyone to 100 percent funding. And you know, we're always arguing and pitting the urbans against suburbans and rural against, you know, everyone's pitting themselves against each other. There's no need to. We have a formula that is constitutional if we run it properly. And we can absolutely get to a full funding formula in five years. So Sweeney is pushing a plan he announced about two or three weeks ago. Christie kind of stole his thunder last week with this fairness formula. But the fairness formula has already been called dead on arrival in the legislature. Uh, urban Democrats rail against it. Uh, the Supreme Court might have a problem with it, although there are now more Christie appointees on the Supreme Court. And it's a complicated sell. I've heard the governor try to sell plans at town halls for years. The, the many numbers involved in this one make it a little more complicated. I'm Michael Aaron in Wall Township, Monmouth County. Mary Alice, back to you. Thank you, Michael. And standing by now at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda, time to hit the road? Absolutely, Mary Alice. And it is shaping up to be a very busy holiday weekend on the New Jersey Turnpike, Garden State Parkway, and pretty much all the other highways across the nation. AAA projects 43 million Americans will travel over the Independence Day holiday weekend, and most of them will drive. That would be the highest number of July 4th holiday travelers ever. And AAA says that's because gas prices are about 46 cents per gallon lower than last year's prices. The agency estimates U.S. drivers have saved $20 billion on gasoline so far this year compared to what they spent in 2015. Travelers who fly out of Newark Liberty International Airport will have some new options starting this fall. Discount carrier Allegiant is adding service to Newark with four new routes. Beginning in November, service will be available between Newark and Cincinnati, Savannah, Georgia, Asheville, North Carolina, and Knoxville, Tennessee. Introductory one-way fares will be as low as $39. New Jersey is one of the wealthiest states in the nation, and now we know the names of its richest residents. NJ Biz has compiled a list of the top 50 wealthiest individuals living in the Garden State, at the top of that list, Donald Newhouse, with a net worth of $10.3 billion. He owns several New Jersey newspapers and other media holdings. He's followed by Robert Johnson, worth $3.7 billion, and Peter Kellogg, worth $3.4 billion. On Wall Street, after two days of steep decline, stocks staged a bit of a recovery today. The Dow up nearly 270 points, and the Nasdaq and S&P also closed higher. And that's a look at our top business stories. Mary Alice, back to you. Thanks, Rhonda. Lowering flood insurance premiums by raising a signpost. That tops tonight's Garden State Express, our first stop, Middletown, where Hurricane Sandy is now history with historical markers to prove it. Monmouth County's collaborating with FEMA to plant signs posting the 14 feet above sea level high water mark, as many as 100 of them, to stand as a stark reminder of the damage severe flooding can do and to help lower flood insurance premiums for homeowners in 14 participating towns. The National Flood Insurance Program is hoping the signs encourage homeowners to elevate their houses and towns to toughen up their defenses against future storms. Next to Oceanport, where this summer's scourge of the sea has shut down Clean Ocean Action's annual fundraiser, dime-sized clinging jellyfish have infested the calm waters of the Shrewsbury River. Their wicked sting can cause excruciating pain and serious medical problems, including kidney failure. One swimmer's already been hospitalized. And caution being the better part of valor, Clean Ocean Action has postponed its shore paddle stand-up paddleboard event on the Shrewsbury River until spring 2017. Meantime, the Department of Environmental Protection says if you see a clinging jellyfish, take a picture and get out of there. Finally, Little Falls, where a member of the Cuban national baseball team is out of there, reportedly having defected. After a mall trip, the team boarded buses headed to their next ballpark when they discovered 24-year-old outfielder Lazaro Ramirez was missing.
Tonight, Ramirez's team, without Ramirez, plays the Jersey Jackals at Montclair State University, Cuba's last stop on their 19-game tour with the Can-Am Baseball League. It's the first time the Cubans have played baseball in America since 1960, but not the first defection. Ramirez follows Mets star outfielder Jonas Cespedes and Yankees closer Araldus Chapman in fleeing the Cuban national team for the American majors. And that's our Garden State Express for Tuesday, June 28th. Something up in your town? Tip us off. As if Atlantic City didn't have enough problems, it's bracing for a strike ahead of the biggest weekend of summer. Brenda Flanagan is standing by with the details. Brenda? Well, Mary Alice, negotiations continue, but right now the forecast for Atlantic City's holiday weekend looks troubled, with a strike by casino workers likely this Friday if their union can't reach an agreement. That's according to Unite Here Local 54's President Bob McDevitt. He updated reporters this afternoon about contract talks with five casinos, Tropicana and the Taj Mahal, plus Caesars, Bally's, and Harrah's, and said the union's 96% strike authorization vote helped motivate negotiations. Negotiators. Even though the strike deadline's July 1st, that's not a hard cutoff. The union will keep talking into the wee hours if they see progress. But McDevitt warned that sometime Friday, they'll ask for a last best offer. The unions won't strike casinos that reach an agreement. The rest will find pickets at their doors. It's really their choice. If they want to put a bullshit contract on the table, then they'll get a strike. So it's really their choice. The folks who work in Atlantic City are much more prepared to be on strike and sacrifice than a bunch of Wall Street fat cats who have been doing nothing but sucking money out of Atlantic City for the last 10 years. Now, the union wants givebacks of wage and benefit concessions they made in 2011 when the casino industry took an economic hit. Casinos have said they want to negotiate fair contracts. Union members spent today picking up their strike cards and training to be strike captains. McDevitt said nobody wants a strike, but if it happens, picket captains will remind workers to obey police, saying the minute we start breaking things, we're going to lose the overall argument. Talks resume tomorrow with Caesars and Tropicana and with Taj on Thursday. Mary Alice. Thank you, Brenda. In six weeks, 42 newly named U.S. rowers will be in Rio competing against time, tides, and contaminants for a place in Olympic history. And they'll have an extra layer of protection, razor-thin, antimicrobial, watertight body armor. Aaron Delmo reports from the U.S. Training Center in Princeton. I think all of us are really uh, working hard to make sure that the environment down there is uh, safe and that it's healthy and that it's fair uh, so that the results end up being the athlete's results and not the results of some other factor. Curtis Jordan is the high performance director of U.S. Rowing, entrusted with keeping his athletes safe and healthy during the Rio Olympics amid concerns about water quality and the Zika virus. To that end, new uniforms. These training suits by Boathouse Sports are water repellent, seamless, and perhaps most notably, come with an antimicrobial finish. There's no seams in the garment. It has engineered venting throughout critical points in the garment. It includes an engineered uh, lumbar strap in the back. The construction or the garment itself is made of uh, a lot of different fibers, very, very, very fine fibers including some fibers or yarns that we produce with antimicrobial features to it. It'll be a couple of weeks before the team has the new training suits in hand. Jordan says athletes will have a good idea of the pros, the cons, and the overall fit by the time they decide whether to wear it for competition. One thing the team already knows, be wary of the water. 
11 athletes and four coaches fell ill last year while competing in Rio at the World Junior Rowing Championship. The World Rowing Federation said the water's fine, but an independent analysis by the Associated Press showed high levels of viruses and bacteria from human sewage at the site of that race and in the city's other Olympic water sport venues. The U.S. rowing team is hoping their uniform's antimicrobial finish is as good as it sounds. You know, we're concerned a little bit about the quality of the water down there, so by having this, uh, uh, this attribute, it keeps the, um, the athlete a little bit healthier and it keeps a chance of them being able to compete a little bit stronger. Concerns compounded by the Zika virus, a mosquito-borne disease linked to birth defects in newborn babies. We will have a, um, a process that we will coat a lot of their uh, clothing with a, um, uh, a substance that will protect them. And we'll see how well that works. Jordan says the focus now is on training together. The U.S. rowing team finished naming its members last week. To have that dream come true is, is just unbelievable. It's unbelievable for them, for their family, for their friends, for their loved ones. And then all of a sudden that responsibility settles in. Now I've got to go perform. Now I'm going to be put on an um, uh, international stage and asked to produce a medal. And so that, that little bit of gut kicks in, so, uh, but that's athletics, and that's, that's what makes it great. U.S. Rowing High Performance Director Curtis Jordan said he wants this team to earn headlines for the work they put in, not the obstacles they overcame. In Princeton, I'm Erin Delmore, NJTV News. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Now to policing the police. The deaths of black men and boys at the hands of police officers have sparked a national debate about race, policing, and civil rights. The Department of Justice has intervened to impose reform in several departments, including Newark's, accused of rampant and routine civil rights violations in one of the most violent cities in America. A frontline documentary team embedded for a year with that department. Historian and New Yorker contributor Jelani Cobb went on a ride along and witnessed a stop and frisk, then showed it to a police supervisor. Here's what happened next. I didn't do nothing. Stop. Just stop, sir. Just stop. Sir, you're not under arrest. Okay. Just for your safety, I'll okay. see you. I'm going home. Yeah, that's why we're stopping yeah. to talk to you. Home. When you right start here, pulling right away, it's on. Right here, right here. I'm talking I didn't to you. nobody. Look, we ain't going to do that. So is that a good stop, not a good stop? You know what? It starts at the point where they encountered him. I would have to read the report to, to see exactly how that unfolded. But I understand that by perception, by perception only, mm -hmm. that would look like it was a, uh, a bad stop. Jelani Cobb joins us now. What was your initial reaction to what you saw on the ride along? And did talking to the supervisor change your perception? No, it didn't. Uh, I was very disturbed by it because the young man uh, was on his way home. He did not have any contraband on him, and he was kind of aggressively taken to the ground. There was no point at which he had done anything that connoted that he was a threat to the general community before they stopped him, hmm. uh, and certainly not a threat to the six officers who surrounded him at the time that they got out of the car. The police officers you shadowed seem to have no qualms with their policing and saw no need to change how they went about what they termed field inquiries. Did any of that surprise you? Uh, it didn't surprise me entirely. Uh, I mean, I think that they were very secure in the idea that they were doing what was needed to make the community safer. And, uh, you know, on some level, people could make that argument, I suppose, but they were also... Uh, there was also one kind of needling little technicality called the Constitution. Uh, and so I think that that was an afterthought to many of the activities that were taking place. Your takeaway from this, the challenges of, of internal and external uh, community relations, if you will, is the uh, new department up to it? Uh, I think it is a difficult task. Uh, I think it's possible for them to, to be successful here, but I don't have any illusions, and they certainly do not have any illusions that this is going to be something that's a quick fix or something that would be relatively easy to do. Uh, easy to do if they had the equipment, but there's a scene where Mayor Roz Barak is walking through a dispatch station that doesn't, where the lines are down and they're handing information to each right. other on wads of paper. Yeah, and that's another part of this. Like, when we talk about the uh, efforts at police reform, 
it's some of this is also the the reform you can afford you know uh, it's like an old uh, New Yorker cartoon where there's a lawyer asking a guy, how much justice can you afford? Uh, in this instance, the ideal kind of policing uh, would be probably more exp a more expensive proposition than the city of Newark has in its coffers right now. Okay, Jelani Cobb, thanks very much for being with us. And you can watch Frontline's Policing the Police on 13 at 10 p.m. tonight and again Thursday at 3.30 a.m. Tomorrow on NJTV News, that gas tax hike has a hill to climb in the Senate. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance, and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. PSE&G, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. And the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. My husband and I spent more than 30 years in the public schools. We're retired, but we like to stay involved. Do you think he's going to learn to fly? We're just as busy now as in our teaching days. The same goes for a lot of the retired educators we know. Let me see you all flap your wings like your penguins learning to fly. Teaching is all about building relationships, and that never goes away. Because once a teacher, always a teacher. We're Ed and Miriam, and we are proud to be New Jersey educators.